Well, good morning. If you want to take your Bibles and go to Mark chapter 5, we're going to be continuing there this morning. For those of you who are visiting with us, we've been working through the Gospel of Mark. And today brings us to Mark chapter 5, verses 21 to 43. Hospitals can be sad places. With the exception of the birthing center, most people who are in the hospital don't want to be there. Some of you I know have had experience working in hospitals. You've seen many difficult realities in the hospitals. You've seen children who are in very difficult circumstances. You've seen parents who are losing their loved ones. You've seen people without hope. And in in many ways, hospitals are institutional reminders that we live in a fallen society, that we live in a fallen world. And though our passage today doesn't take us to a hospital, it in many ways could have. It brings us into contact with two very broken people. One of them seems to be losing hope, and the other one very likely may have lost hope many years ago. In this passage, we're going to be confronted with a young girl who is dying and a woman with a debilitating chronic illness. And yet, at the same time, like this passage, like almost every other passage that we're going to consider in the Gospel of Mark, it confronts us with Jesus as well. It confronts us with the great physician, and it, it shows us in some ways an intersection. You imagine two roads coming together, the road of Jesus and the road of pain and suffering that we experience in this world. And again, this passage is going to confront us with at least two questions, questions we've seen before, and the questions are, does Jesus care, and can he help? Does he care about what I'm dealing with, and can he help me with what's going on in my life. I know that some of you, even in this room, have children who have serious health issues. You know the grief of being unable to just fix it for your child, the emotional turmoil that goes on when there's things you can't do to make it better. And some of you, I know as well, know what chronic illness is like. You've had it for years and you feel like you've tried everything and nothing helps, and that can cause a sense of despair. And you may remember back in chapter 4, the disciples asked a very critical question, which could be considered here today as well. In chapter 4, verse 38, the disciples look at Jesus and say, don't you care that we're perishing? And in a sense, that's what the people in the passage today are, are asking. Do you care, Jesus? Can you help? And he does care. And as we look to him in faith, he can help and he will help. So let me go ahead and read in a moment here, Mark chapter 5, 21 to 43. Before I read it, I just want to kind of give you the heads up that this is another sandwich of Marks. So if you look in verses 21 to 24, we're going to be introduced to Jairus and his daughter. That's the top piece of bread, if you will. Verses 25 to 34, we have the woman with this discharge of blood. That's the central portion of the sandwich. And then in verses 35 to 43, we come back to Jairus at his house, and that would be the wrapping up this sandwich, so to speak. So perhaps that structure will help you as I read. So beginning in Mark 5, verse 21. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him, and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better but grew worse. 
She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Verse 35, while he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. <clears throat> they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people wailing and weeping loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, our desire this morning again is to hear your word, to be taught by you. Father, we pray for your spirit to take this word and set it and plant it deep within our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so as we come to verse 21, you see Jesus and his disciples who, are, who have been on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. They're now trans, um, transitioning back to the western side of the sea. And Jesus is there on the sea. A great crowd is around him. We come to verse 22, and we're introduced to this man named Jairus. He's called a ruler of the synagogue. He's a Jewish man. According to verse 42, he's got a daughter who's 12 years old. Some of you in here are daughters who are 12 years old. Maybe you could envision yourself in the shoes of this young girl. She's sick. Jairus' daughter is sick, and she's so sick, she's about ready to die. Jairus is coming. He's pleading with the Lord Jesus. In fact, this girl is so sick, she's going to die before we even complete the passage this morning. And Jairus is there begging Jesus. The, the ESV uses the word implored. If you look back in the earlier parts, or if you just remember the earlier sections of chapter 5, we saw a lot of begging going on. Begging from the people in the community for Jesus to leave that area. And the demoniac begging him. The, the demons begging. Well, this is the same word. This, this man here is before Jesus, and he's begging Jesus to help to do a miracle, to do something to save his daughter. As we come to verse 24, it says, and Jesus went with him. I'm not sure what Jairus was expecting at this point. He does say, come, come to my house, come be in the presence. So he must have been encouraged that Jesus says, yeah, I'll come. I'm going to come and be with you. He, Jesus was willing to be interrupted. We don't know exactly what he was doing. Perhaps he was beginning to teach or just arriving. We don't know, but Jesus was willing to go there. It, it kind of just makes me think of times when I've had sick children and I've known that there's nothing I can do. It reminds me of one time we were in the ER with one of our children and they had had a temperature of, I think it was 106 for several days. And I didn't know that this was necessarily bad, but people were telling me this is really concerning kind of thing for this many days. And so finally being in the hospital and just having a doctor that's there 
with me kind of relieves some of that pressure that you feel like I have to do something. I wonder if this is how Jairus was feeling as Jesus is agreeing to go with him. So then in verse 25, we come now to the middle portion of the sandwich, to the woman. And she would have been in this great crowd that verse 24 talks about, this great crowd that's following him, that's thronging about him. She would have likely been seeing everything that Jairus was saying and engaging with Jesus. Verse 25 says, And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years and had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better but grew worse. Contrast this lady with Jairus. 12 years ago, Jairus had been blessed with a daughter. A daughter he loved, clearly. 12 years ago, this lady was afflicted with this bleeding problem. Jairus was sick. I'm sorry, Jairus was healthy. This woman was sick. Jairus was a leader in the synagogue. This lady, because of her bleeding problem, couldn't even enter the temple. And yet both of them come to Jesus for help. It's interesting, it doesn't matter what level or status we have in society, none of us can escape the fallenness of living in this world. It doesn't matter how much money we have, it doesn't how much matter what our position is, we can't get away from the brokenness in this world in which we live, and yet it doesn't matter who we are. Jesus is willing to be interrupted. Jesus is willing to hear us and have us come to him. And sadly for this woman, her situation had gone from bad to worse. She's been sick for 12 years, so we're in 2024. You go backwards to 2012, we could imagine somebody in our midst who's been terribly sick for 12 years. It's a significant portion of someone's life. And Mark even uses an interesting word here. She's suffered under many physicians. That's not really what you think about when you think about going to the physician. To, to, I'm going to suffer under a, a physician right now. In the best case scenario, she had to en- endure under well-intentioned physicians who prescribed some kinds of treatments that were just not pleasant or uncomfortable. In the worst case scenario, she had to undergo traditional medical procedures that would often involve things, I don't, I'm not saying in this particular case, but in, across the world, it could have involved various burnings, could have involved various painful procedures, drinking certain portions, anything that's supposed to help with the various illnesses that, that we have. And not only did she have to suffer under these treatments, but she was financially paying for them. It's one thing to have to undergo those things, but then you're paying for them, you're paying for them, and multiple physicians, multiple treatments, multiple payments. I'm sure she had other things that she would have liked to spend her money on, but she didn't feel like she had an option. This is what she had to, had to go after to find relief for this. The situation itself may have precluded her from marrying, from having children. She may have had no family to, to care for her. And listen to the words. I don't know if you heard this as I read it the first time, but just the words that Mark uses. She had suffered much under many physicians. She had spent all she had and got no better. There's a lot of uh, extreme words being used there. This is where she's at, and she's not getting better. She's just getting worse. Verse 27, she then heard about Jesus and she somehow began to believe and to think, if I could just touch his clothes, if I could, I don't even need to touch him, I don't need to talk to him, I don't even have to look at him, if I can just touch his clothes, I'll be better. Verse 28, if I touch even his garments, I'll be made well. There's a sense we can say, well, this is like some kind of, maybe there's some superstition going on in her, what does she know about Jesus, what is she hoping from Jesus, if I just touch him, but yet, many of us, and in Many in our society do similar things to this. We touch a sacred object with the hopes that it's going to make our situation better. You've seen images of sports teams coming out of the locker room, touching various objects. Why? Because they think, well, this is going to make something better. Our performance is going to be better today because of what we've just done. And maybe it's even more of that. Maybe it's a fear. If I don't do that, then it's going to jinx me or something like that. And yet, in this woman's situation... 
it worked. Verse 29, and immediately after she touched him, the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately, physically healed. And it was such that she felt it and she knew it and she experienced it. And yet at this point, we're talking about this, we're thinking about this. In that context, it was a completely secret healing at that moment. No one knew about it except for the woman and Jesus. There was no words exchanged, no explanation had been given, and nobody else could see it or know it. Verse 30. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from, himself, from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? His disciples said, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? Jesus, come on. <laughs> How can you ask that kind of question? I I wonder if the disciples were comically confused. Like, confused, why are you asking it, but almost laughing, like, what kind of a question is that? Everyone's touching you. When we were in the Middle East, I had an American, a good friend of mine who was from America, and we would often visit local people together and do ministry together, and on On one occasion, we had visited some particular guy, and I don't remember his name or what happened about it, but it had been a few days after we had visited with this individual, and my friend and I were were discussing this particular guy, and and I wasn't remembering which guy he was talking about, and so he said, come on, Ryan, it was the guy who had the long beard. I'm like, do you realize what you just said? Like, that narrowed it down to the male population. This is what the disciples are saying to Jesus, like, what are you talking about? So verse 32, and Jesus looked around to see who had done it. Again, think about what's going on. Jesus is searching now for this woman. He's looking for her. She'd been healed by him. And as I said, apparently she, you know, she didn't, it seems purposely, didn't come around in front of Jesus and try to have a conversation with him. She just wanted to be like out of the spotlight, just touch the garment, and that'll be, that'll be good enough. And perhaps, there, like I said, perhaps that was because there was a little bit of superstition going on. We don't know exactly, but she just wanted to be healed and move on with life. And yet Jesus wasn't interested in just a healing without a relationship. Jesus wasn't interested in power just going out of him to help her in life, moving on with life. He wants to see the woman. He wants to talk to the woman. He wants to know who she is. And I think because Jesus knew that that touch contained at least some tiny measure of faith, he wanted to engage with the woman. And I think the woman somehow saw and and knows some of this because in verse 33, but the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. In a matter of seconds, Jesus had brought peace and healing into this woman's life. He'd given her relief and hope. She could now hope again. And you notice in the text, her response included both fear and faith. She came in fear and trembling. That's, we've seen this. It's becoming a little bit of a pattern in in the passages that we've seen. The response of the disciples to Jesus when he calmed the storm was, they were afraid. The response of the townspeople over with the demoniac, when Jesus healed him, they were afraid. Now this woman, she's just been healed, and she's in fear, in trembling. And yet for this woman, it's an appropriate fear mixed with faith. Because she comes before him, she falls down before him and tells him the whole truth. She bears her soul to him. Again, how much faith did she have when she was originally touching him? It's unclear, but Jesus clearly, you're going to see in this passage, he sees faith in what she's doing. Perhaps some of that faith that he sees is as she falls down before him and tells him the whole story. As she sees his interest, as she sees his care, as she sees that he wants to engage with her, those walls in her life come tumbling down. Perhaps she had not shared the whole truth with many people before. And there, in the front of Christ, in the front of the whole crowd, 
She starts telling about her disease. She tells him that it's been 12 miserable years. She tells him about all the doctors that she's been to, how she spent all her money, and it's only gotten worse. The whole story, the whole truth. Her faith is growing as she's doing this. And he looks at her. Jesus looks at her now. He hasn't said anything to her. There hasn't been, she's been just talking to him. And he looks at her and he says, daughter, daughter. I wonder if those words were enough to cause her to crumble again and be broken. She would have heard Jairus talking about his little daughter who was at the point of death. She would have seen how Jairus cared for his daughter. And she would have seen how Jesus was willing to help Jairus and his daughter. And now she's sitting there and Jesus looks at her and takes the fatherly position in her life and says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. This woman seems to have initially been a bit fearful of a relationship with Jesus or at least hesitant of a relationship with Jesus. She just wanted to be healed, but now Jesus is showing her that he wants a relationship. He wants to relate to her as a father and take her as a daughter. He says, your faith has made you well. And then he pronounces a blessing upon her. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. And this phrase, go in peace, doesn't mean that he's like, get out of my presence and just do it in peace. But no, he's, it's like, go on living your life now in peace with the blessing of peace. One commentator I read at this point says, discipleship is not simply getting our needs met, but it's being in the presence of Jesus, being known by him and following him. And I think probably this woman, like the demoniac we saw last time, probably did not want to leave Jesus' presence. Knowing what she just experienced and knowing what she just heard, she probably wanted to continue with him. And so then we come to verse 35, the bottom portion of the sandwich. While he was still speaking, so this is like Mark, it's just happening right on top of one another. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house someone who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? Put yourself now in Jairus' shoes. You're on your way to your house. Jesus is coming to your house. Whoa, Jesus has just healed this woman. He's just heard this woman's testimony. And then the news comes, she's dead. That was his greatest fear. Come, Jesus, come to my house and help because my daughter is at the point of death. You need to come now, Jesus, because when she dies, then it will be too late. It's final. It's done. She's died. And as much as our modern technology can keep us healthy, none of us can escape that reality either. As healthy as we may be at this point in our lives or as unhealthy, every single one of us are going to meet that exact same finality. And in some ways, the messengers who are bringing this news to Jairus know that. Why trouble the teacher any further? It's too late, guys. Jairus, don't just, we can just stop it now, the process, whatever's happening. It, she's dead. There's messaging in that question. Why trouble the teacher any further? What's the message that's in there? She's dead now, and he can't do anything about it. It's hopeless. She's gone. We're out of time. And now notice Jesus' response, verse 36. But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. Jesus looks at him and says, hey, you don't need to listen to what they're saying. You don't need to hear their messaging. You need to hear what I'm saying to you. Do not fear, only believe. Again, now thinking about Jairus who had just seen the woman be healed. He had just heard the woman tell her whole story. He had just heard Jesus say, your faith has made you well, woman. He'd seen an example of faith. Jesus now turns to Jairus and says, 
Now, Jairus, you exercise that same faith right now in this moment. Jairus, you need to look to me and you need to believe me. You need to believe. He says only believe. Well, what's Jairus supposed to believe? What's he actually supposed to believe? You could kind of fill in the blank. Believe what? Believe what am I supposed to believe? There's a lot of different answers that we could give that. A lot of different good answers. But at the end of the day, the answer is you need to believe me, Jesus says to Jairus. Not so much what I can or might do, but you need to believe in me. Jairus had demonstrated a measure of faith in coming to Jesus to heal his daughter. But now, with this news of her death, his Whatever faith he had is, is being shaken. He's wavering. He's uncertain. He's tempted to be afraid and not believe. Jesus knows that, and that's why he says, do not fear. Jesus comes alongside of him and encourages him and says, keep on believing in me. Kind of reminded me of Peter's situation as he's out walking on the water, and he looks away and sees the waves and goes, starts to go down. But as he keeps his eyes on Christ... It's a different situation. And for Jairus, he needed to do the same thing. He says, Jairus, don't look at the circumstances. Look at me. Believe in me. So verse 37, as they continue on to Jairus' house, verse 37 says, And Jesus allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. There's all kinds of commotion. The people are grieving the woman's death, the girl's death. And then Jesus does what it seems like he, this isn't the first time he's done this. He comes in and he stirs up the pot and creates a little bit of trouble and controversy. Kind of like if you can remember back to when he was healing the paralytic. He comes in and rather than just healing the guy, he says, son, your sins are forgiven. And then that just like throws a, you know, kindling into the fire and stirs everything up. Well, here he says, verse 39, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child's not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Now, if you think about the whole context of what's happening here and what Jesus is about to do, he didn't have to make any of those comments. He could have just kept his mouth shut. So why is he doing this? Why is he saying the child's not dead, but sleeping? The mourners knew the girl was dead. In fact, Jesus himself knew the girl was dead. So why did he make this comment? Think about that for a little bit. We're going to come back to it in a second. Verse 40. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise, And immediately the girl got up and began walking. She was 12 years of age, and they were immediately overcome with amazement. So Jairus takes, I'm sorry, Jesus takes Jairus, Jairus' wife, the girl's mother, Peter, James, and John, and they go in, and he grabs the girl by the hand and lifts her up and raises her from the dead. She gets up, and she begins walking, and she's healed. And of course, everyone's overcome with amazement. Why are they overcome with amazement? It's it's one thing that Jesus had healed a paralytic. It's one thing that Jesus casts out demons, but now he's raising the dead. And you see the shocking reality of this because what did these people who came to Jairus say? She's dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? What Jesus is doing is on a whole nother level. And it shows us something about Jesus. Think with me of some of the things we've seen as we've been moving through Mark. He's the Lord over the wind and the waves. He's Lord over the whole creation. He's Lord over Satan and the demons. He's bound Satan. He's casting out demons. He's Lord over the whole spiritual realm. And now here, he's Lord over life and death. And and from, from an earthly perspective... Even from our perspective at times, death is so final and so ultimate. And yet to Jesus, death is just another foe to overcome, another foe to conquer. 
For those who are looking to him in faith, death is just a temporary reality. Jesus calls it sleep. The little girl, from Jesus' perspective, is just asleep and needs to be waken up. That's why he's stirring up the pot. He wanted to address the fact that when we are following Christ, death is not something that we need to fear. Death is not an ultimate reality of our lives. In one sense, yes, it's something we're going to experience, but in another sense, no, it's not going to get the victory over us. And then as Mark begins to bring this to a conclusion in verse 43, he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Again, I want you to contrast, what is he saying here to Jairus, to his wife, and to their family? By the way, it, it seems almost impossible for them to not let people know this. I think it's kind of like, as far as is possible with you, you don't need to let people know this. But the girl's going to walk out alive. How, how does that not get known? And yet, contrast what he's saying to them here in the region of Galilee with what he was saying to the demoniac back over in the region of the Decapolis. It's the opposite instructions. The demoniac was told to go and tell everyone. Why? Well, in the Gentile region of the Decapolis, on the eastern side of the Jordan, no one there was really trying to, like the scribes and the Pharisees, destroy Jesus. And at the same time, no one over there either was trying to get and make him king. They wanted to get rid of him, yeah, but they weren't doing what they were trying to do in the Jewish regions. Here there was danger of the common people trying to force Jesus to become king or of the religious leaders trying to arrest him and to destroy him. And Jesus is essentially saying here, the time is not right for that. There's going to be a time to make all of this known, but now is not the time. So Mark has given this sandwich to us. I just want us to ask, what are we to do then with this passage? What, what are the takeaways for us? How are we to respond and think about this? First of all, I think it's very noteworthy for us to consider that this is a passage about women. It's a passage about a little girl and a passage about a grown woman. It's a passage about how Jesus cared for them. Later in the Gospel of Mark, we're going to read... When Jesus was in Galilee, many, which is where this is taking place, when Jesus was in Galilee, many women followed him and ministered to him. This verse tells us how Jesus valued women and allowed them to follow and serve him. Perhaps this woman in our passage is one of those women that's being talked about. As the early church grew, the scriptures record for us the value that was placed on the women in the church. They're the ones who are privileged to be the first to see the resurrected Lord. There together with the men and waiting for and receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. Paul calls them co-workers in the faith and describes them as those who work hard in the Lord. So the example of our Lord and the example of the early church in valuing and honoring women is an example and something that we should follow as well. Notice also this is a passage about faith. It's the faith that this woman displayed toward Jesus. It's the faith that Jesus encourages Jairus to display. Only believe. As we think about this faith, there's these underlying questions that I've asked us earlier on to consider. Like, does Jesus care about these people? And is he able to help them? Does Jesus care about our issues? And is he able to help us? Think about what we've seen. Did Jesus care about the disciples? And was he able to help them in the midst of the storm? Yes. Does Jesus care about the demoniac? And is he able to help him? Yes, Jesus went to the demoniac for that reason, and he was able to help him. Does Jesus care about this woman and the little girl? And can he help them? Yes, he can, and he does. So that begs a question. The next question we should ask is, does he care about us, and is he able to help us? The answer is yes, he can, and yes, he will. But then you could very well raise an objection. You could say, but I'm still sitting here with a chronic illness. My child is still sick. Those healings in the Bible are great, but, but I've not experienced anything like that. And it's a valid response, and I think the question, this passage that we're looking at actually even addresses that. Jairus was in the same situation that you might be in or that I might be in. 
His daughter was sick. He went to Jesus asking for help. And Jesus didn't help him. And Jairus' daughter died. There was a time in this passage when Jairus could have objected and said, and I think I'm even going to propose he was, he couldn't have not been doing this, that as he's walking to his house, he's wrestling internally with this exact same objection. Yes, you healed that woman, but my daughter just died, and you didn't do anything about it. My wife, she's at home dealing with my dead daughter, Jesus, and you haven't helped. The healing is great for that woman, but what about me and my family? We haven't experienced any miracles. I think at that point in the passage, Jairus was in the same situation as many of us would have been. He had asked Jesus to help him, to heal his daughter, and she had died. And Jesus' answer to Jairus at that point is in many ways the same answer of Jesus to us today. Do not fear only believe. Jairus didn't know how Jesus was going to help his daughter at that point in the story. Jairus didn't know when Jesus was going to help his daughter. I I think we can even say Jairus didn't know if Jesus was going to help his daughter. But Jesus' response was, you don't need to be afraid. You can believe. You can trust me. And so what Jairus was called to do as he walked to his earthly home, we are called to do as we walk to our eternal home. We may be afflicted with all kinds of physical ailments. We may have had them for many years. Jesus knows he himself was afflicted as well, and he will help. Our experience will be the same. If we are in Christ, our experience will be the same as that of the little girl. He will say to us, arise, arise. Somebody might object and say, well, Jairus only had to wait for maybe a couple minutes or a couple hours. He got earthly relief. I've been waiting for years, and I'm not getting earthly relief. Jesus' answer is the same. I know your affliction. I know your pain. You need to believe and look to me. I think as we think about some of these objections that I've raised, It makes me, I think it can be helpful to think about how Jesus responded to Peter in John 21. Jesus is talking to Peter and John about the future. Jesus is talking to Peter and John about different futures. And Jesus says, if it's my will that such and such will happen to him, Peter, what is that to you? You follow me. In time and space, Jesus doesn't deal the same way with all his disciples. As believers in Christ, we're promised the resurrection. Yes, Jesus raised this 12-year-old girl in an earthly sense, but she was going to die as well in her earthly body. Jesus healed the woman, yes, but in God's providence, she had suffered for 12 years. Our ultimate hope is not that we will be healed in this age that's not, what, that's not the hope to which we look. Our confidence is not that we're going to experience a miraculous healing in this lifetime. We have no promises to that end. And yet, as we look to Christ, we await our ultimate and eternal healing, our resurrection from the sleep of death. And just as Jairus said to Jesus, Jesus, come, lay your hands on her, we too, in a similar way, are saying, come, Lord Jesus, Come. I think I'm going to close. I wasn't planning this, but I think I'll just close this way with this verse that Scott pointed out to us, the last verse of when trials come. One day, all things will be made new. I'll see the hope you've called me to. And in your kingdom paid, paved with gold, I'll praise your faithfulness of old. I'll praise your faithfulness of old. One day all things will be made new. I'll see the hope you've called me to. Christ has not called us. Yes, he's doing wonderful miracles here and demonstrating who he is, that he's the Lord over all of creation, life and death, wind and waves, spiritual realm, everything. And yet he calls us to follow him 
to believe him and to set our hope in what he has promised us, not necessarily in a healing that we're hoping for in this life. Now, as you see the bulletin, if, you, if you're interested and you would like, we're going to look tonight at the question of should we pray for miracles and what does it look like in praying for miracles? You can come back this evening and we can consider that. So let's close in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for the testimony we've considered about the Lord Jesus. That he is the one who is able to raise the dead. He is the one who has all power over life and death. Lord, I pray that you would help us again to see who this man is. To even ask the question, who is it that raises the dead? Father, we pray that as we've heard your word, that your spirit would take our attempts to to explore your word and to hear your word proclaimed and that you would do what only you can do in our hearts. Give us hope, Lord. Increase our faith. Strengthen us and mature us. And for those, Lord, who don't know you, for those who are looking on at this saying, who is this man? Who is Jesus? I pray that you would reveal him to them. In Jesus' name, amen.